Forrest Whitaker, though often playing the role of gentle giant, can really bring the heat as a badass when the role requires it. That's why today we're going to be looking at the top 10 most badass roles of Forrest Whitaker. Originally making it to college by virtue of his size and football playing talents, he eventually transferred his academic focus toward music and acting. That's right, he was kind of like the true life story version of Finn from Glee or Troy from High School Musical. We're glad he made that choice, as his 40-year acting career has spawned some true greatness. Directed by Miguel Sapochnik, who you may know from also directing the most awesome battle scenes in the Game of Thrones series, this movie was his feature film directing debut. If you're familiar with 2008's Repo, the genetic opera, it's just like that, except without as much singing and no Giles from Buffy. Also, don't confuse it with the 1984 Emilio Estevez movie Repo Man. Although, much like Aliens is the sequel to Alien, Repo Men, being the pluralized version, is the sequel to Emilio's movie. No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. Actually, the plot is about a future where medical technology has advanced to the point where people can buy artificial organs to extend their lives. So, much like a car or a house, if you default on the payments, the bank has to repossess. In other words, take back the organs. Jude Law is the main protagonist, Repo Man. Whitaker plays his partner. Being that most people kind of object to having their organs repossessed, the agents have to be kung fu super action soldier types. After various plot things occur and Jude is on the run from his own organization, Whitaker is the one out to get him. In the dark times of the Star Wars franchise, when all was crap, there was one brief bright shining hope. A movie that didn't completely suck. That movie was 2016's Rogue One, a Star Wars story. The untold story of the brave rebels who stole the plans for the original Death Star. Though mostly stocked with newly imagined characters, the writers did take the opportunity to insert the pre-existing character, Saw Guerrera, into the life of the protagonist, Jin Erso, in a mentor-father figure capacity. Saw Guerrera was previously part of Star Wars lore in the animated Clone Wars series. A rebel leader, Saw was always portrayed as an extremist, willing to let issues of morality fall by the wayside if they conflicted with attaining victory and vengeance. Whitaker portrays a version decades older, more jaded, and more battle-scarred, both physically and emotionally, than the one we saw in The Clone Wars. Following Rogue One, he lent his voice and image from the movie to other Star Wars projects as well. There's a reason he's evaded the Empire for this long. He's a freedom fighter? He's THE freedom fighter. Despite coming out on Netflix in the middle of a global lockdown when people were really desperate for things to stream, How It Ends did not do very well. Forrest Whitaker, though, did his usual bang-up job, managing to spin gold out of shite in his role as ex-military pissed-off father. A brief summation of the plot. Take Guess Who, the Bernie Mac Ashton Kutcher comedy that was a reverse Guess Who's Coming to Dinner of 1967 with Sidney Poitier. Mix that with Dante's Peak and maybe a little bit of National Lampoon's Vacation to get that road trip vibe. And to be clear, How It Ends is nowhere as good as any of these movies I just mentioned. But as stated previously, Forrest Whitaker does stand out as the stern, disapproving father forced to tolerate the extended presence of his weak, not good enough for his daughter sort of son-in-law due to a road trip through an apocalyptic danger zone. Before we move on to the next item on the list, I'd like to take a moment to ask that you remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. And now, back to the countdown. Whitaker plays the hitman Decker. He's burnt out on the job, ready for retirement, but he reluctantly takes one final job. He's hired by a smarmy weasel of a husband to kill his wife and baby. The wife is played by Sherilyn Fenn, just coming off of her success in Twin Peaks. The plan, of course, goes awry through a combination of the blazing sweetness of Sherilyn and the weird, powerful connection that forms in a short time between Hitman and Victim. You would put me through all this if there was no hope with you. <laughs> Highlights of the film include, there's the constantly growly voice narration by Whitaker. I had to get out of town, but I had one piece of unfinished business first. Also featured the first criminal talking to a psychiatrist trope, 
before it was even made a trope by Analyze This and The Sopranos. Who plays the shrink? This guy, who you probably don't recall playing Country Club Douche Number 4 in Trading Places. And she stepped on the ball. <laughs> Besides Sherilyn Fenn, there's also small roles played by Sharon Stone a year before she blew up in Basic Instinct, and Jim Belushi playing corrupt police detective guy. And as a final point, Decker uses a revolver with a silencer because Hollywood doesn't know guns. In general, while a suppressor can help reduce but not eliminate the report of a gunshot by slowly dissipating the escaping gases caught in the suppressor tube at the muzzle, the gap between a revolver's cylinder and its barrel allows gas to escape at the other end, thus defeating the entire purpose of a silencer on a gun in the first place. This series is based on the real-life story of infamous crime boss Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson, played by Whitaker. Johnson, following a 10-year stint in prison, returns to his old neighborhood to find that things have changed a great deal in his absence. With the streets now controlled by the Italian mob, Bumpy has to take on the Genovese crime family. This is a meaty, complex role for Whitaker. Bumpy Johnson was a man who was admired despite his brutal criminality because of his strong sense of family, community, and personal independence. For example, as part of his war with the Mafia, he has to form alliances with many black civil rights leaders. Whitaker is perfect for this role, with his stern, quiet exterior thinly covering the capability for brutal violence. Speaking of Forrest Whitaker's stern, quiet exterior thinly covering the capability for brutal violence, our number five spot is internal affairs detective John Cavanaugh. Appearing in Season 5 of FX's The Shield series, it's questionable whether he was the villain, the hero. Definitely, he was the antagonist to Vic Mackey and the strike team. But they're kind of bad cops, thus Kavanaugh is the good guy, right? See, that was the beauty of The Shield. No one was a black and white character. Vic Mackey was corrupt as hell, but he also had plenty of outright heroic moments. Whitaker's Kavanaugh started out as intense and by the book, a crusader against police corruption. His obsessive war to bust the strike team began tearing him down, though, making him question his beliefs and eventually to cross the line. The best part of Whitaker in this role, with everyone else Vic Mackey and his compadres had tangled with before, no matter what else happened in the show, they had the ultimate trump card of force and violence. Try to bust them on some procedural violations or squirting law, ultimately they could just put you in the hospital or the grave. But Kavanaugh stole that advantage from them. Whitaker played his role with this seething torrent of rage barely kept in check by his professionalism. You could tell when they were face to face, you could tell Mackey and the team did not want to F with him. In the end, they, the strike team and Mackey, had to tear him apart psychically and emotionally, pushing him over the yeah. edge. Who this guy is? It's Kate. Your friend. Who you sent to check up on me. Well, he did. Play an eccentric, brutal African military dictator? Sure, why not, said Forrest Whitaker. And the result? A Best Actor Oscar. So that worked out well for him. This 2006 biopic, or is it biopic? Biopic? Anyway, uh, this 2006 biographical picture of Uganda's Idi Amin explores his reign of power through the eyes of his physician. And talk about a challenging role. In order to capture Amin accurately, Whitaker had to be equal parts charismatic, paranoid, wacky, and outright terrifying. The most interesting part of this movie was finding out just how truly bonkers Amin was. His official title was His Excellency President for Life Field Marshal Al Haji Dr. Idi Amin, VC, DSO, MC, Lord of all the beasts of the earth and fishes of the sea, and conqueror of the British Empire in Africa in general and Uganda in particular. 
And if that wasn't enough, he appended uncrowned king of Scotland to his title in 1976 due to his admiration of Scotland as a symbol of resilience and resistance against English colonialism. Enthusiastically sharing his enthusiasm for all things Scotland, Amin would often play Scottish music for visiting dignitaries, offered to liberate Scotland from British rule, and wore a kilt to a Saudi royal funeral. He was a wacky dictator long before the Kim Jongs made it mainstream. I'm so lonely. The number three position is a bit of a cop-out, followed by an apology, then capped off with an educational montage to mollify viewers. My top ten list only had nine items in it. You can't post a top nine video, it's just not done. See, the problem is, Forrest Whitaker plays a lot of thoughtful, sensitive, not-so-badass roles. Are there any that I missed? After you watch the remainder of this video, think about it and let me know in the comments. In the meantime, you will have noticed a running montage of Whitaker playing some smaller roles in big movies. And now we rejoin the list at number two. Fast Times at Ridgemont High is the ultimate classic 80s comedy, responsible for introducing actors who would go on to great success, including Sean Penn, Jennifer Jason Leigh, and Nicolas Cage. There's also the absolute sexiest scene ever put to film, starring Angel Brought to Earth, Phoebe Cates. Another important introduction to Hollywood was Forrest Whitaker in his feature film debut. Though having a somewhat small role in a large ensemble cast, Whitaker manages to shine in his scenes as football star Charles Jefferson. After surfer slacker Spicoli and Jefferson's younger brother trash his Trans Am in a drug-fueled joyride gone wrong, and knowing that the big scary Jefferson would absolutely murder them, they cleverly turn the situation around, blaming the wreck on the rival high school that they were about to face in a big championship football game, Spicoli and Little Jefferson avoid blame and, showing some school spirit, manage to ensure a win for Ridgemont High. Here's the setup. Forrest Whitaker is a street orphan who decides to follow the way of the samurai and becomes a mafia hitman. Give it to indie director Jim Jarmusch and score it with a pounding soundtrack by the RZA, Wu-Tang Clan, and Public Enemy, and you have the makings of a truly awesome movie. As a samurai, Ghost Dog is a scholar, a poet, as well as being a man of incredible violence. The word samurai translates into English as servant. Accordingly, Ghost Dog has pledged to serve a lower-rung mafia loser named Louis, who seems in no way worthy of the respect and subservience Ghost Dog affords him. This is explained eventually in a flashback scene where Louis saves a teenage street kid from a severe beating and or death. And that street kid was Ghost Dog. His discipline and dedication to the path of samurai never wavers, even when at the end of the movie he's slated for extermination by Louis, his master. As a true samurai would, Ghost Dog sacrifices himself, doing so in such a way that it advances Louis's standing in the mafia. Ghost Dog is such an unusual original movie, you can't help but enjoy it, and Whitaker is at his best. And that does it for our video today. Thanks for watching. Let us know how you liked it in the comments section, and also don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel as we bring you more thoughtful and intriguing content in the future.